And so this is one of those situations where, uh, as I recall, uh, it was a, that tick is originally a deer tick. So is this another one of those cases, as we heard so much uh, this uh, year about uh, swine flu, of something which has jumped from uh, from animals to humans? And as we, you know, again, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a scientist, but it seems to me that those situations seem to present particular uh, particular threats. Yeah, well, the other the other thing that needs to be, uh, I think, discussed here is is the question of the environment, and I believe that the extent to which our bodies are out of balance, so is the environment, or you could put it the the other way: the extent to which the environment is out of balance, so are our bodies, are um, the uh, and we are actually seeing more and more um, microbes that are becoming more virulent because of uh, um, uh, ecological change and um, global warming, to be specific. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah. it, is, it is definitely an issue, and um, we, you know, we, we need more we need more research into into what is happening on on an ecological level in terms of microbes and um, their interaction with with our bodies. Okay, so I do, by the way, have the patient that uh, Andy Abrams Wilson, uh, Mandy Hughes, will be joining us. But right now, I want to go to Dr. Richard Horowitz. Uh, Dr. Horowitz is the um, currently the uh, president of the International Lyman Associated Diseases Education Foundation. He was previously president and vice president of the International Lyman Associated Diseases Society. Um, he is in private practice in Hyde Park. And before I uh, say hello to Dr. Horowitz, let me tell people, if you want to learn more, let me give you a couple of websites. One is underourskin.com. That's the website of the film. You can see clips. You can learn more about the history. But they also have a really nice uh, set of resources, websites, uh, quite extensive, that you can go to. And then... Uh, there's several of these organizations have their websites. I'm going to just give you LymeDisease.org, which is L-Y-M-E, Lyme, uh, in case anyone's confused about that. It's named after the city in Connecticut where uh, it first got named. So that's why it, it stuck with that. So LymeDisease.org. Uh, welcome, uh, Dr. Richard Horowitz, to KPFK and Free Forum. Yes, thank you. Okay, so my question uh, to you is, is um, as a doctor, how uh, how long have you been dealing with this? Um, well, I'm a board-certified internist, and I moved to the upstate area of New York uh, about 20 years ago. So it was shortly after I moved up here that um, I was seeing quite a bit of Lyme disease. So at this point, um, I've seen over 11,000 chronic Lyme patients who've come to me from all over the United States and even all over the world. Okay. And... Um, I'm just guessing that if I were a doctor and I began seeing cases, I would refer to whatever the establishment said, whatever the experts said at first, and kind of figure that, that they probably knew what they were saying. What has been the evolution of your uh, sense of what the disease is and what the treatment is? Yeah, when I, and that's exactly what I did as a physician. Initially, I was following uh, very simple guidelines, which is if a patient had a rash, uh, you would treat for 30 days, and that would be it. And if they remained ill, it would be chronic fatigue syndrome or fibromyalgia. Um, but what was obvious to me very early on is there was a group of Lyme patients, when you got them early after the EM rash, that about at least 20% of them would go on to chronic Lyme, where they would complain of a lot of fatigue and headaches, memory problems, joint and muscle pain that would move around their body, tingling and numbness. Um, they couldn't fall asleep. They'd be waking up frequently. They were depressed. They were anxious. I mean, a whole host of symptoms that just kept returning, and I essentially went to uh, CME conferences to learn about it, started going through the medical literature, and discovered really that there was quite a bit of controversy and that the literature, in fact, said that Lyme could persist in the body. So I started developing protocols, um, you know, based on the information, and it's kind of evolved over the years. Okay, and um, what is, what is, just so people, people don't stick around for the whole hour, what is... The, uh, where should someone go if they sense they may have this, and what is the treatment? And, and my sense is that there's two very different um, 
Two very different situations here. One, if you catch it early, and two, if you don't. And one is, I guess, what I would call you know, immediate or, or, or early uh, Lyme, and the other is chronic. Correct. Um, well, the thing about it is that everyone knows that early Lyme um, can actually be cured. We don't use the word cure in chronic Lyme, but you can, you can cure up to 80% of the patients when you get them early. The problem even with early Lyme, though, is that within 24 hours, the organism that causes Lyme disease, Borrelia burgdorferi, can get up into your brain um, and establish itself there. Uh, so it moves through the central nervous system really quite rapidly, and that's probably why we don't um, get people cured early on. So if anyone has a rash and they have a stiff neck or they have a headache or the light is bothering them or they're sensitive to sound, that means it's gotten up into the central nervous system, into their brain. Or if they have tingling or numbness of their hands or feet, that means it's gotten into their peripheral nervous system. So that's a way you know if you have early Lyme that 30 days is not going to cure it. Now, if you don't catch it within the first 30 days, that's usually when it goes on to the late stage. But what a lot of doctors don't look for is they're not realizing that when people get chronic Lyme, it's usually not just Lyme. These ticks are now containing a whole host of other organisms, including Babesia, which is a malaria-like organism. So some of the men and women will come in complaining of drenching night sweats, day sweats and chills. That's a malaria-like Right. I can imagine a doctor then says, well, have you been to the tropics? Right. And they say no, and then, then you're off in a, in a mystery. Correct. And, and these patients with chronic Lyme will not get better if you don't find these co-infections, these other bugs that got in. So now they've got Babesia, and they have cat scratch fever, which is Bartonella, and they've got Mycoplasma fermentans, the organism that causes Gulf War syndrome, and they've got Ehrlichiosis or Anaplasmosis. So what happens is they get all these different bugs in there, and their immune system just can't handle it, and they become chronically ill. Now, what you've just told me, I must say, I'm, I'm Terry McNeil. This is Free Forum on KPFK, and I'm speaking with Dr. Richard Horowitz. He's a uh, physician who treats a lot of folks with Lyme disease. Um, th this thing of a tick that originally put out one spirochete, and, and, and the discovery of this spirochete was a big deal, and, and so now we've found the culprit and so on. What, what is the explanation for why this particular tick now carries or can carry so many um, in, in, in infectious organisms? And I guess, to my mind, I'm saying, why hasn't that happened with all sorts of other things? Why aren't mosquitoes now carrying two and three things? So what, it, what do people think is the answer for that? I mean, it's, it's a good question. I mean, for example, Bartonella, which is cat scratch fever, it's probably in part because people are moving out into the country. You know, they're cutting down woods. They know that the highest epidemic of Lyme is when you're living very close to the wooded areas. And if you've got cats that, you know, go out and the ticks get on them and then the ticks pick up Bartonella, they're going to transfer it to humans. Um, and as far as Babesia goes, it usually was only in the Cape Cod, uh, Long Island area. But, you know, the ticks have migrated over time. So... Um, I can't say exactly with the mosquitoes why it hasn't happened, although there are some doctors that are finding now um, spirochetes in mosquitoes um, and are finding other organisms. So <clears throat> I think there is a certain evolution that is happening over time with many of these different bugs. Uh huh. I, I, one thing that I've always uh, said is any of those people who uh, don't believe in evolution, um, go talk to a microbe. Mm -hmm. um, because the, 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 the sad thing about it all is that evolution works quickly in microbes, uh, because that's just the, their lifespan and so on, and and we evolve slowly, and so the 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 the, uh, the long term battle favors them. Right, and the thing about the evolution of these particular bugs is that um, one thing about these bugs is they have more DNA than any other bacteria on the face of the planet. Um, they've got 21 plasmids. Um, the closest relative is chlamydia pneumonia, um, and these bugs know how to combine their DNA. So if you get several different species, there may be a whole bunch of genetic combinations that are taking place. Um, so there's probably a genetic evolution that's taking place also very quickly for that reason, too. Right, and so people don't get confused. When you say bugs in those sentences, you're talking about the microbes, not the ticks. Correct, correct. Okay.